Okay, hi everyone. We are now on to talking about therapeutic ultrasound. So therapeutic ultrasound is a natural um, transition from our conversation of heating because one of the main goals of using ultrasound is to provide heat but deeper than our superficial heat. So remember back to our um, thermal therapy chapter that superficial heat we get from moist hot packs and warm whirlpools and paraffin, those only reach about one centimeter to two centimeters deep. Our therapeutic ultrasound, we can get much deeper into tissue, um, and it's also not affected by adipose tissue like our um, superficial heat is. So, Ultrasound is acoustic energy. So, so far we've been talking about most of our energy um, when we we're talking about Easton being electromagnetic. Um, here we're talking about acoustic. So it's not a form of electromagnetic energy. We're talking about inaudible acoustic vibrations at a pretty high frequency. So ultrasound is typically somewhere between 750,000 hertz up to 3 million hertz, which gets us to a we usually talk about it in megahertz, so 0.75 to 3 megahertz uh, frequencies. Just to compare that, audible sound is somewhere between 16 to 20 kilohertz, so significantly lower, hence the ultra sound. Um, so anything greater than 20, th or, um, 20 kilohertz is usually considered ultrasound. Um, like I said, therapeutic ultrasound tends to sit between those frequencies of 0.75 and 3 megahertz, um, which is just another way of saying cycles per second. So like one megahertz would be a million cycles per second. And within that range is, is FDA approved. There's also um, ultrasound out there that is now being called low intensity um, pulsed ultrasound that potentially has values lower than our 0.75 uh, frequency. Um, and those are used for some more specific um, causes. So ultrasound is going to rely on molecular collision in order to transmit um, that molecular trans, um, collisions that are happening from the ultrasound vibrations. That's what's going to produce the thermal and the non-thermal effects. So we can have heating or we can manipulate our settings to have um, non-thermal effects, so where we don't get any heating or any heating we do get is um, able to be countered by the body, so it's able to, able to be um, kind of dispersed before it actually causes any uh, temperature increase. So the collisions cause molecular displacement and wave um, of vibration being perpetuated into the tissue. And we talk about therapeutic ultrasound being used for medical purposes. This is different also than diagnostic ultrasound which is where we visualize. So what you think of with um, pregnancy and, and visualizing the fetus, we can also use diagnostic ultrasound um, orthopedically to visualize structures, um, especially tendons um, and, and joint structures. So this is different. This is for medical purposes, for treatment, for therapy. Um, lower frequencies of, of Ultrasound energy tend to have greater depth of penetration, while higher frequencies are a little more superficial. Um, that will come into play. So our one megahertz can get up to about six centimeters deep. Three megahertz, which are typical settings for our ultrasound, can be about two to three centimeters um, deep for penetration. So another thing about ultrasound that we'll talk on is that it's very much the therapeutic agent that targets tissues rich in collagen. So um, those tissues that are really high in collagen are going to respond to these molecular vibrations much more significantly than those that have a high water content. Um, so tendons, muscles, ligaments, muscles, muscle bellies are a little bit different, but the fascia within the muscle is definitely um, collagen-based. Ligaments, joint capsules, joint menisci, um, intermuscular interfaces, potentially nerve roots, periosteum, things like that are really going to respond to the ultrasound vibrations.
and deep tissue temperatures can be increased without significant skin temperature increase, unlike when we try to do superficial heat, which has to go through the skin. Here, the ultrasound waves can travel through the skin and through the adipose tissue to target our deeper um, tissue. So based on the parameters that we get to set with ultrasound, these are kind of all the different things that we can do with it. So it can increase tissue repair rate, increase wound healing uh, rate, increase blood flow, which we would expect with increased temperature, increased tissue extensibility, which we would also um, expect with increased temperature, potentially decrease calcium deposits, break up those calcium deposits, um, and then decreases in pain and muscle spasm because of the changes in nerve conduction velocity that can occur, um, especially again with the heating and changes in cell membrane permeability that happens because of the um, vibrations of ultrasound. And then some specialty areas, um, delivering medications, that's what we call phonophoresis. So we had iontophoresis for um, e-stim. We have phonophoresis where we can use sound waves to, to drive medications, and then potentially fracture healing. But those settings for fracture healing are different than the settings we have on our typical therapeutic ultrasound machines. And you'd have to have a special generator to do um, the fracture healing settings. So one of the biggest concepts to understand is how does the ultrasound um, unit produce the sound energy? Okay, and what we do and how that happens is what we call an indirect or sometimes called a reverse piezoelectric effect. And now we're going to talk about the indirect and then I'll explain the direct in a minute. But the indirect is what happens for ultrasound. Okay, and what happens is that we have a current that moves through the crystal and causes deformation or vibration of that crystal at a very specific speed. So we send electricity, an AC current, into the crystal and that causes the crystal to expand and contract. Um, that, that expansion and contraction within the capsule that is the sound head or what we call the transducer, as the crystal expands and contracts, it pushes air and the air molecules out and in and allows those molecules to get pushed close together or to spread apart. So you've all already watched kind of the review of how sound waves travel. Okay, this is, this is how that's happening. So the air molecules get pushed together when the um, crystal expands, and then when the crystal contracts, space is left open. Okay, And that produces that acoustic energy. So it happens inside the transducer head, and then that can be submitted and sent out the transducer head um, through a conducting medium into the tissue. The direct effect, which was discovered first, and so why it's the direct effect, was just the opposite. They found that if the crystal, these um, specific type of crystals um, that are usually a um, kind of mix of metal and quartz or silicone or things like that, as those crystals were found to expand and contract, it created a voltage. Okay, so an electrical voltage was created when the crystals expanded and compressed um, due to some other form of energy causing those crystals to expand and compress. So when people were, were determining, well, if we can produce electricity this way, what happens when we add electricity to the crystal? And they found that adding the electricity to the crystal caused those expansions and comp compressions, and then that if you trapped that, that would create sound waves. Okay, so it's really important to understand that we do the indirect or the reverse piezoelectric effect, which is sometimes called the electric piezo effect to show that reverse, but that's what it is. So again, this AC current comes into the crystal, crystal then expands, and then when the AC current changes direction, right, because that's what the current does, then it causes it to contract. And so we produce these areas where the air molecules are going to get compressed together and these areas where the air molecules are going to be more spaced apart, which is going to create that, um, that wave. So when that wave is created, okay, and when it's transmitted from the transducer head, the sound head, into the tissue, and we need a conductant median in there, and the reason we need that is because the way um, 
ultrasound and sound energy and acoustic energy in general travels is through longitudinal waves through um, and those longitudinal waves are through solids and liquids okay and so it does not travel in air okay very well the type of waves that we need for therapeutic ultrasound so we have um, the displacement of the direction of the wave is in the same direction as the propagation of the wave so if the sound heads here the waves would be looking like this and they would travel into the tissue through the skin through fat muscle ligament whatever soft tissue we have okay so both so solids and liquids okay so that makes up all of our soft tissue um so as it's that uh, longitudinal wave the vibrations is happening along the direction that the wave is traveling um, alternating between areas of high low pressure that the ultrasound beam has created so within the longitudinal wave like I mentioned and what you've seen in kind of the review of sound is that you have these areas of compressed uh, molecular activity and these areas of spaced um, and and relaxed molecular activity and we call those areas of compression and areas of refraction i like to think of it as a slinky right so when you're playing with the slinky how the slinky travels if you have areas where the slinky coils are really tight together and then you have areas where they're really spaced apart and then you can see that when you play with the slinky you can see those compressions move through the slinky and so that's the same way that the wave travels so the wave travels from these areas these troughs where we have refractions to areas of compression kind of the height and then we go to refractions and so just like when we talked electromagnetic we can use the same type of terms wavelength amplitude it just means a little different because we're talking about these areas so our peaks our amplitudes here are these areas of compression and the troughs that we see are going to be these areas of refraction so compressions have high molecular density and um, refractions are areas of low molecular density as those um, areas get pulled apart, those molecules get pulled apart. So like we said, longitudinal waves transfer through solids and liquids as we go through the soft tissue. But when that longitudinal wave hits something as solid as the bone, something happens. And that displacement, let's go back, that displacement um, happens that it changes the wave from moving in the same direction, the displacement being in the same direction as the wave propagation, to being perpendicular direction. And so now, as the compressions and refractions get moved, the wave itself actually is transversing along the bone. Okay, And that's how it's going to travel only in solids. And so that's what happens when, when we hit the bone. Um, it doesn't necessarily change our, our effect. Um, it's just the different way that the wave travels. We will also talk that as we move through these different soft tissues, we're going to get a difference in how the energy um, is transmitted. And in some places, we're going to have reflection where we're going to end up with um, some of the energy not being transmitted through but reflecting off these surfaces. And that can create some difference in the amount of heating and experiences that we have within the ultrasound. So here's that, that um, box from your book. So basically, we have kind of three things that happen when the ultrasound wave hits a different density um, structure. Okay. So one thing that can happen is we can get total reflection. So this occurs when the wave can't pass through the next density. So the next density is too strong or too different from the current density. So the wave strikes the object and reverses in a direction away from the material. So it could be complete, it could be partial, it just kind of depends on how different that density is from the, from the density of the material that the wave was moving through. Um, so an example being an echo. Okay. Now for us, we're going to have some areas like um, the transducer and air barrier. Okay, So when the transducer head meets air, that has almost 98% reflection. Um, so we'd get almost total reflection, meaning we're not going to have anything transmitted um, any further into tissue. So that's one of the reasons we use a gel or a conducting medium. Also within the body, um, where we meet... Um, intermuscular um, junctions, when we meet um, the outside layer of, of 
the tendon meeting bone, all those areas have a little bit more reflection to them um, than traveling through the other soft tissues. Refraction happens when bending of the waves occurs. So when we enter, the density changes, and so we get a little bit of a reflection or a refraction, meaning that the wave bends. So this is a typical like prism, right? That's how we get the rainbows of a prism. The light enters and it bends in that density. The same thing can happen to ultrasound. We can get a little bit of a bend. And then we have absorption. So this occurs when um, the wave collects all of the energy and changes it into kinetic energy. So in the sound wave mechanism, that's gonna change that into potentially heat um, if we're at a high enough level or it's gonna change um, the propagation of the, of the wave and how the cells respond. And it's gonna basically be turned into kinetic energy within the body. <clears throat> so this is gonna be our goal when we're trying to target tissue. We want absorption to happen at the layer that we want to target. And so we'll use our different settings to be able to try to um, absorb as much energy at the level that we want. And so this goes back to our law of growth of Straper that we talked about with Eastim and we talked about with cold and heat, right? There has to be enough energy available to get to the target tissue. So if we absorb everything early and we're trying to target something deeper, that's not going to work. Um, and so we would need to have settings and um, energy available to not only if we're going to lose some absorption to superficial tissue, but also be able to target the deeper tissue. And an issue we can see with that is what's known as attenuation, okay? And attenuation is this decrease in the energy. So it's, it's losing steam. It's not a good thing if we want deep penetration, okay? And it's, it's directly related to the tissue density that this wave has to keep moving through. So as those densities change, it's going to become harder for us to keep up enough energy to keep transmitting the wave. And we're going to lose more to either reflection or absorption. Um, at one megahertz, the ultrasound travels through soft tissue at about uh, 1,540 meters per second. So that's significantly slower than the speed of light, right? In electromagnetic energy, we're talking the speed of sound. And in this case, sound is always affected um, by the medium. The speed of sound is always affected by the density of the medium that it's trying to travel through. So one megahertz through soft tissue is about... Uh, 1540 meters per second. But again, as we attenuate, as we lose to absorption, reflection, and refraction of the wave, we lose that ability to target deeper. Um, and we bounce off tissues, and that's known as dispersion or scattering. So some of that energy is always going to be absorbed by um, the tissues as it passed or be reflected or, or have some sort of uh, refraction. But ideally, we create enough energy and we use the right parameters to be able to continue that energy deeper to then be absorbed um, at the tissues that we want to target. So this is um, an example of an ultrasound kind of wave, okay? And we have two areas to kind of consider. We have what we call the near field, okay, which is also sometimes called the Fresnel zone, and we have the far field. So when we first create this wave, okay, the distribution of the energy is, is kind of non-uniform. It's kind of the manner in which the waves are, are generated based on that crystal expanding and contracting, which isn't a perfect system, okay? It doesn't perfectly happen the same way every time. Um, we're usually a little more um, discattered um, up in the near field, okay? And we have a little bit more um, divergence of our... Um, the absorption of the energy. And then we get to this point of maximum acoustical uh, intensity, which has the most energy available in the most directed form. And then as we get to the far field, the distribution gets more uniform, but you also potentially need longer treatment times to get down here. You would need all the energy to be able to get through the near field, have not lost some of this energy to um, the other tissue, uh, and so on. Okay, so the higher frequencies, if we use higher frequencies, they tend to be less divergent. Um, they can be more collimated, but we can't get as deep. And so when we add depth and get to our lower frequencies, um, we're, we're going to then also see a little bit more divergence um, in the waveform.
as we get kind of beyond this point of maximum acoustic energy. So yeah, close to the head, the pressure of the sound waves is pretty non-uniform. We have lots of ridges and valleys, um, and we tend to use this area a lot in our therapy, and so we have to kind of manipulate and understand those ridges and valleys and what that means.